Hey, I'm Mike Gilliam, and welcome to Let It Rip. We're coming to you from the CUNY TV studios in the shadow of the Empire State Building in New York City. In 2023, black art is everywhere, but it's been always a part of the foundation of black society, from Paul Robeson and Nina Simone to Beyonce, Rihanna, Denzel Washington, and Michael B. Jordan. And throughout the years, African Americans at the top of their game in the arts and the art itself have also been at the forefront of many of the achievements we've made in the areas of civil and human rights. We might not even celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's life and birthday if it were not for the efforts of artists like Stevie Wonder, who in 1980 released the single Happy Birthday during the push to create the national holiday honoring Dr. King's birthday. Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier became leaders of the civil rights movement and artists and celebrities have played a huge role. And there are many stage productions like Raisin in the Sun that have had a huge impact as well. So let's talk about the importance of black art and the artists who produce it. We have three guests, the Director of Community Engagement at NJPAC in Newark, Aisha Marble. We also have a theater legend, a director and producer of stage and screen, and the founding director of the New Federal Theater, Woody King Jr., along with the New Federal Theater's producing artistic director, Elizabeth Van Dyke. This is a special Black History edition of Let It Rip. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Elizabeth, what, how do you see the role of black theater and the arts as far as society is concerned? I think art reflects society. I think it reflects who we are. I think art sometimes resonates issues. I think art can be healing. I think art can be illuminating. I know black theater helps so many of us who came here on the Middle Passage find pieces of ourselves in different pieces. Uh, so art, black art, is very, very important to our society. Aisha? It is our intellectual, emotional, and social experience and response to what's happening in society. When we have an issue in society, our dancers, they choreograph. We have Alvin Ailey responding. We have our new company members. We have Camille Brown. We have Abdel Salam with Forces of Nature. We have Arthur Mitchell's new company responding to the issues today. So when we have concerns in society and we see something, we say something. We say something with our whole body. We say something on Broadway. Yeah. We say something on any platform we can possibly find. And we so appreciate the Apollos. We appreciate the New Jersey Performing Arts Centers and all of those Newark Symphony Hall, <clears throat> places where they give us platform mm -hmm. to speak loud, to be heard, and to make sure that our people purchase tickets or give them tickets free for those who can't afford to get there. We make sure that we're heard. Woody, I'm very curious. You've done an awful lot in the theater over the years, okay? Yeah. But what inspired you initially to get involved in theater? Uh, I saw uh, uh, a movie, The, the Defiant Ones, with Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis. Mm -hmm. And uh, two or three weeks later, I saw Raisin in the Sun. And I was in Detroit. And I said, my God, these are black, this is blackness. This is who I am. I've been dabbling in the arts, and after high school, I just jumped into it. Didn't realize I had to study so hard, and I, I think I studied in Detroit for three or four years, working in the factory midnight to 7 a.m., going from the factory to drama school, and uh, from then on, I sort of like moved into the professionalism of it. Mm -hmm. And when I got to New York, they were starting things like the anti-poverty program and mm -hmm. How You Act and Bedford-Stuyvesant Redevelopment Corporation and uh, uh, Mobilization for Youth. And uh, I realized, wait a minute, I know all this already. And so I was hired by Mobilization for Youth to um, train young artists. So all of a sudden I had 35 or 40 young artists 
Did you come to New York to get involved in theater? Yeah, yeah, I came to New York to get involved in theater. But I had to have a job. Mm -hmm. And so the job naturally led me to a job in theater. And that job in theater led me to these young people. And these young people delivered, taught dance, taught theater, music, and art. And they excelled. Let's like, talk a little bit about the, the new federal theater and the fact that it has been so successful. Elizabeth, talk to me about some of the people who have come through there. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> Felicia Rashad, just name the list. It goes on. Denzel Washington, Latanya Richardson Jackson, Samuel L. Jackson, the late, great Chaswick Bozeman, Issa Rae, Debbie Allen, writers, Ed Bullins, Emery Baraka, J.E. Franklin, uh, David Henry Huang, and the list goes on and on. It was a launching place. Woody King created New Federal Theater because there was no place for us in 1970. And he created that place to integrate minorities at that time, people of color and women into the mainstream of the American theater. And look where we are today. Boy, are we so, not in the mainstream <laughs> of the American theater? Yeah, but you're still doing things now. You have a, a big premiere coming up, right? We have a big premiere. We're doing a film, a screening of a film about the great Glenn Turman, the legend of Glenn Turman by uh, Junie Smith. We are doing it on February 2nd at Riverside Theater. February 2nd, 2023 is also the beginning of Black History Month. It is also the 53rd anniversary of New Federal Theater. Nice. Wow. Wow. Years. wow. And Glenn Turman traverses, as Louise words, Black history. In 1959, he originated the role of Travis in A Raisin in the Sun, and you see him today on How to Get Away with Murder, he's done Cooley High, Queen Sugar, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. It is an impressive list, too. I was looking <laughs> at it a little bit earlier. It's very, very impressive. You, you all mentioned the fact that um, this is grounding kind of uh, in our communities as far as the theater is concerned. Um, how do you at NJ Pack manage to keep what you're doing there a part of the community, to draw the community into that. It is so important for us to identify community partners. Mm -hmm. We have advisory council, we have elders, we have a council of the elders. Mm. And we figured out how to do that at BAM with uh, Ola Pamatunji, mm. with uh, Dance Africa, with our um, uh, uh, Abdel Salam now is, is our Baba right now. But we figured out that the council of elders helped us understand our past mm -hmm. so we can prepare for our future. So we're identifying the new Sarah Vons mm. in New Jersey because our leaders know where our young people are, where our middle age um, artists are who haven't been working in some time. We identify where they are, we give them platform, we pay them well, and we give them space to share their artistic uh, freedoms. And my goodness, our we have a, um, sharing at Clement's Place. Clement Price was an amazing artist in uh, the New Jersey area and surely we have a jazz jam every third Thursday and we have people come out of the woodwork to make sure that they share their artistry. So we find uh, partners, we have over 140 partners to make sure that we can get the artistry out into the community. And we have about 100 or so people come to each um, event that we have off campus. Of course, we love when they come to NJ Pack. Right. But everything off campus is free.com. Okay, I'm very curious about one thing. We often talk about how um, the feeder system, how the public schools aren't getting the funding that they need to support young artists. What are you seeing with the people who are coming in now? Are they prepared or is that still lacking? Well, we're excited that we have an amazing arts education program and certain uh, cities do, but I, I gotta toot our horn. We actually draw the kids from the uh, public school systems and we train them on Saturdays. If they get to us at 10 years old, they're ready to graduate from Berkeley 
or Juilliard mm. prepared to become consummate artists. So we take them in at whatever age they come in. But so they you're lead. the feeder. We are the feeder. We are the feeder. And our arts education program has been around since the building went up. And it is amazing. Uh, we have people from Broadway that come back to teach them. We have Mark Gross, who's on Broadway now. He's our director of jazz studies. So they make sure that they build the next generation. It is all about building legacy. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, um, how important do you think what's happening in the theater now is to what's happening as far as human rights and civil rights is concerned? Is there a connection there? There can be. Mm -hmm. Most uh, The last play that we did was a play that just won best production called Gung Lum's Legacy. Mm -hmm. And Gung Lum's Legacy treated Chinese and blacks in the 20s in the Mississippi Delta. And it was an intersectionality of the two, and you know what's happening to Asians in this country uh, and the Black Lives Matters. So to do that on stage, to have talkbacks and audiences, Asian and black nights, to bring that together to explore that, to do that kind of play is very relevant, very um, resonant, mm -hmm. necessary, and again, enlightening, educational, entertaining, and healing. Woody, let me ask you this one. Where do you see theater, African-American theater, going in the next 10 years, next 20 years? Wow, I think it's going to move around the country. I think it'll be much, uh, many more uh, productions in places like uh, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, uh, moving f from New York around the country. It's not going to be a standstill. And it'll play two weeks here, two weeks there, uh, four weeks somewhere else. And if it's, uh, and there'll be a lot of young people in these plays and a lot of young directors in these places. But uh, I see it more as a, a kind of communication it's not, it will not be, New York will not be the center. Now it's for tourists. Uh, I see theater and dance and jazz moving around the country. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something that's sorely needed. Yes, yes. Okay, that's going to have to do it for now. I want to thank our guests, the Director of Community Engagement at NJPAC in Newark, Aisha Marable, and from the New Federal Theater, the founding director, Woody King Jr., and producing artistic director, Elizabeth Van Dyke. Thank you all for coming on. Thank oh, you. Thank you for having Thank us. you for having That's us. Wonderful. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue our Let It Rip Black History special. We'll meet the new president of Medgar Evers College and discuss the college and her vision for it. And we'll have a special poetry performance. This is Let It Rip. Welcome back to Let It Rip. I'm Mike Gilliam. This is a Let It Rip special celebrating Black History Month. And we have a guest here to discuss an institution that is a part of the fabric of the African-American community, Medgar Evers College. Medgar Evers was established in 1970 and as part of the CUNY system, currently has a little over 4,000 students. But its reach is far greater, having prepared thousands of students for their professional careers. What lies ahead? Where will the school go over the next 10 or 20 years? Here to discuss the college and her vision, we have the president of Medgar Evers College, Dr. Patricia Ramsey. Welcome to Let It Rip and CUNY TV. Thank you. You've had some time to settle in there, right? How do you see the role of Medgar Evers in the community? Um, Medgar Evers College is inextricably linked to the community. And so coming in, I did a lot of research. I just started in 2021 as the first woman and for a scientist to come to the college as president. And I knew that I really needed to connect to community because of how the institution was founded. Um, it was mentioned that the institution was founded in 1970, but it actually started with the community advocating for a college in Central Brooklyn in 1963. Mm -hmm. And that community, including um, people like Dr. Alvan, recently deceased, who really forged ahead and led the group 
that was uh, a part of this coalition of people uh, and, and organizations in Brooklyn that had people like Shirley Chisholm who were advocating for this college. And so um, as an institution, we always have been predominantly black because it came out of a uh, black community. And one of the things that I'm hoping for the college is that we can actually be grandfathered in as a historically black institution uh, because historically black colleges and universities are those that Congress designated that were founded or established before 1965. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm looking into the research. I've talked to some people about it because we were founded by the black community for the black community of Central Brooklyn. And yes, we have expanded um, much more so today, but um, I think that it would be very helpful to us as an institution to be a part of that group of colleges where there's over 100 historically black institutions because of the community that they provide and also it gives us an opportunity to truly be an HBCU because a lot of people in New York think that Mega Evers is an HBCU. It is actually not because of con congressional designation. We are a PBI, which is, stands for predominantly black institution. And those institutions didn't come into, into being until then Senator Barack Obama actually put forth a bill um, for the establishment of PBIs because he had Chicago State there in his state. Okay. But we are one of the few that actually was started as a predominantly black institution, even without the designation. And what would the advantage of that be, though? Well, the advantage is that historically black institutions, by mandate, get funding from Congress. Okay. Wherein PBIs have to go through the U.S. Department of Education where you have competitive grants mm -hmm. and, there, um, and there lies the difference in that the historically black institutions actually have as a part of the congressional budget funding. Okay. okay. What inspired you to become an educator? Well, um, when I was in 10th grade, I had this teacher, uh, Ms. Bell, Mm -hmm. And Miss Bell was a great teacher, and children always think they can outsmart the teacher. And so Miss Bell asked us, I was in her biology class, and she asked us to, to, to draw our hair, to look under the microscope and draw our hair. Uh -huh. And so I looked under the microscope, and I saw all of these squiggly things, drew it on the paper, sent it in. And when I received my paper back, it had a big F on the paper. Uh -huh. And she said, this is not your hair. And so I argued with her. Now, I'm a 10th grader. I said, how do you know it's not my hair? You didn't look through the microscope to see if that was my hair. What I did not know is that all hair looks the same under a light microscope. I learned that once I got, I, I went into college, majored in biology because of her. Uh-huh. And, um, and did biology education as an undergrad, although I've never taught in K through 12. I just thought it would be something that would be very good for me as it relates to my future. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward now back to Medgar Evers. Where do you want to see it go right now? Are there some changes that you want to see made? Yeah, I, I am really interested in um, the work that already has been done at Mega Evers, uh -huh. but looking to see how we can expose ourselves in a different way. And what I mean by that, I always hear about Mega Evers is a hidden gem. Mm -hmm. I say, well, it's so many great things going on, we don't want to be hidden anymore. Little known fact, Mega Evers produces more science graduates who go on to graduate school and professional school than any other school in CUNY except one. Mm. And we are not a science or tech institution. Wow. Most of our majors are biology majors. Really? Yes. And so um, we are doing what we can, especially looking at what's going on in the nation and even the world now as it relates to the environment 
And so we offer programs in environmental science as well. And we are partnering with SUNY ESF uh, for our students to actually um, get exposed um, to uh, subjects around, the, around climate actually by going and practicing that in the Adirondacks. And then we are partnering with the public schools to bring urban students to the Adirondacks with our students so that we can get more students interested in going into fields in, um, that are related to the environment or to climate, considering what we're going through today in this country. I want to talk to you a little bit about recruitment of students. Um, at Megar Evans, 75% of the students are women. Yet in our communities, uh, African-American men aren't getting the jobs. Uh, they're not going to college. Um, why is that? And is there something that can be done to kind of increase that number? Because only 25% there are, are male. Um, the, across, the, across the nation, right. um, there has been a drop in black males going to college for various reasons. But one of the things that we are doing as an institution, we have a black male initiative. Um, it actually started at Mega Everest. It's spread across CUNY now. There has a black male initiative program uh, where we are trying to interest uh, black males in going to college and once they get there, to persist. And so we're doing some special things um, for our students to assist them in um, being able to persist to graduation. But we are, as a matter of fact, tomorrow I have a meeting scheduled with the um, superintendent of District 17. And we're looking at how we can partner with them to make an impact for the schools that are in District 17 that surround our college. And I was so impressed when I went to one of the schools in District 17 to see that they had brought in these young men from middle school who are part of my brother's keeper. And to see how that organization helped those young men. And we look at all of these types of partnerships because we want to do what we can as an institution mm -hmm. to uplift, to help uplift the community. Mm -hmm. What about the legacy of Medgar Evers as far as the college is concerned? Well, um, I speak about uh, Mega Riley Evers every opportunity that I get uh, because this man sacrificed his life for others. Mm -hmm. Social justice in his DNA. Yes. Um, because the things that he did, he didn't do it for himself. Mm -hmm. He did it for other people. Right. To give blacks in Mississippi the right to vote. And so um, I think it's important that our institution is named for him um, because of how our institution was birthed out of community with social justice in its DNA. And um, as far as I know, he is the only slain civil rights leader that a four-year institution is named for. I think so. Yes. Wow, good discussion. And a good chance to meet the president and get a feel for what inspires her and what she would like to do at Medgar Evers College. Dr. Ramsey, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate the opportunity. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, more on this Black History Month special, Let It Rip. We'll hear and see a bit of poetry that ties it all together. Tyreek Washington Jr. will be here to perform an original work of poetry entitled Thank You. Stay with us. I'm Mike Gilliam, and this is a special edition of Let It Rip. Welcome back to this special Black History Month edition of Let It Rip. I'm Mike Gilliam. We want to close out this show with a powerful piece of poetry written and performed by Tyreek Washington Jr. The piece is called Thank You. Pay attention to all of the detail. It touches many bases. Here's Tyreek Washington, Jr. I am, I am proud to be black. I am proud to be part of a people that exhibit love, passion, beauty, and community that is, that is brilliant and resilient, the cultivators of life and, and civilization, I, I am proud. I am proud to say that I'm a part of a culture 
that is so rich and ingrained into our society, so much so you can't even walk down the street without hearing the influence of jazz or the blues or seeing our influence on style. Art, life, and dialect, I, I am proud. I'm proud to say that I stand on the shoulders of monuments. That's why, that's why I want to thank Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin for being in the pens that I write with. I want to thank Aretha Franklin and Nina Simone for being in the songs that I sing. I want to thank Martin Luther King and Malcolm X for their radical thoughts and ideas, for their drive, for their power, for social justice and change. That's why I am proud to be black. You know, in, in fact, you should be glad that I'm black because, because it's in my step, because it's in my mind, because my people are just so divine. I want to thank all of the black inventors that have helped make our lives better. I'm talking Garrett Morgan, Lewis Howard Letterman, Alice H. Parker, and the countless others whose minds enriched our times. That's why I say I am proud. I am proud. Oh, I'm proud to be, I'm proud to be black. Wow, that was excellent. Our thanks to Tyreek Washington, Jr. That'll do it for our Black History Month special. I'm Mike Gilliam. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Let It Rip. <laughs>